Europe is full of medieval castles that tower over us in all their might and resplendent grandeur. These castles serve as tourist sites nowadays, but what purpose did they serve in the olden times? In the words of Canadian-American architect Frank Gehry, architecture should speak of its time and place, but yearn for timelessness. Through architecture, the old very much becomes something novel. It weaves together layers of harrowing passages through history, presenting a tangible part of the past. Standing before a medieval castle, it is impossible to not be transported back to the time of its inception. The spell of medieval structures enthralls, beguiles, and terrifies in equal measure, and therein lies the appeal. The question, however, persists. Why were they built? Castles were built for different purposes in different parts of Europe, so there is no simple, straightforward answer to the question. To understand how this era of castles came about, one has to delve into the intricacies of the time. So, let's begin. The Normans were among the first ones to build castles in Western Europe. There are certainly castles that predate the Normans, like the Reichsburg Kochum in Germany or the Citadel of Aleppo in Syria. But these examples can be considered outliers, despite serving as foundational works. The trend of creating castles definitely intensified after the Norman conquest. William the Conqueror built Warwick Castle in 1068, which was successively rebuilt over the years. Even though the Normans were responsible for starting the trend of the castles, one must remember that several castles of their era were built atop already existing Roman forts. What is the difference between the two, you might ask? The fort serves a purely military purpose, whereas a castle does not. In addition to being an excellent military asset, a castle was a status symbol. It represented a higher quality of life and emphasized the class structure. Remember that feudalism took hold of Europe during the Middle Ages, so preserving the dynamics of the status quo was a central aspect of life for the nobility. In the beginning, people built castles using wood, but quickly saw the advantage of switching over to stone. The materials used in the construction of a castle represented the prestige and authority of the rulers. Erecting castles was not a cheap job, and rulers often spent 40% of their income building and maintaining castles. Obviously, the ambition and stature of the castle would be reflected in the price. By comparison, the old Mott and Bailey design was much cheaper and quicker to build, but the wood was susceptible to fire and rot. Hence, it became the norm to accept the luxury and safety of stone castles. This was partly due to the Normans' influence on the region. With the castle serving as a social center, in addition to its military use, advancements were in order. Castles now served as centers for local governments. They were hubs of administration and justice and served as the social nucleus of the surrounding regions. Interestingly, the crown did not build most of these castles, at least not directly, nor did they use them all that much. Since this was the era of feudal lords and serfs, the land was owned mainly by lords. These loyal lords had usually been granted land in return for their services in the hour of need, and kings did call on them for this purpose. In the olden days, life was very much restricted to the land you occupied. What went on in the next tribe was of little concern to people, as they probably wanted to just kill and occupy their land anyway. If a king were to destroy your tribal neighbors, you would not take it as a sign of impending doom. You would probably be happy that your squabbles with your mischievous next-door foes had finally come to an end. And this is how kings usually traversed across lands in those days. They would attack those remote tribes and force them to join the army and march with them. As the land granted to loyal subjects, a king could send word to join him in battle against his foes. Usually, lords would fall in line because going against royalty pretty much meant annihilation. However, in some complicated cases, lords tried to leverage their position for diplomatic gains. It did not always end well, but what does? You've probably heard tales of chivalrous knights and their squires moving about and taking part in various adventures. Well, that bit is true. Knights did take part in adventures and were supposed to be chivalrous. In fact, historians call this era in which knights rose to prominence the Age of Chivalry. Knights were trained from a young age and were expected to assume the role of guardian and protector upon reaching maturity. The noblemen, who were granted lands by the king, were also considered knights. 
Now, the tales make it seem that all knights were as chivalrous as Sir Arthur, but that was not the case. On the contrary, knighthood was another institution that ensured the stability of the status quo. The knights had their allotted shares of land, known as a fife, which they administered through their serfs. Serfs were lower-class members of society. They were tied to the land, so upward mobility for them was nearly impossible. Serfs were only slightly better than slaves, and to assume otherwise would be to dampen the historical validity of their situation. Knighthood had its positives. In, In the, the name, name of God, God and Mary, Mary his mother, mother accept, accept this blow and, and never another. Be, be upright, upright, true, and brave. brave. Better a knight than a slave. Indeed, that sounds solemn and noble up until the last utterance. In any case, knights fought for a higher ideal. They were educated, and some were even poets. Knights were expected to fight for Christendom, and considering just how religiously motivated the Middle Ages were, that meant a great deal. It was not hard to justify the construction of expensive castles in the name of preserving Christ's teachings. This religiosity probably prompted the Crusades, but that is a discussion for another time. The castles were the residing places of knights, and as such, safety was a big concern. The location of the castle was often more important than the fortification itself. Generally, castles were built to limit the possibilities of unexpected approaches. For instance, building a castle on top of a hill was preferable. Similarly, building a castle close to a ridge or a body of water would also be preferred, as it would limit the enemy's angle of approach. Once you had eliminated the room for unpredictable offenses, you were able to put up a much better defense. On the other hand, the opposition had their work cut out for them. They not only had to reach the castle, surviving against the hail of arrows, but they also had to get inside. This was doubly hard. For starters, some castles were surrounded by moats, deep ditches that were usually filled with water, but not always, to discourage infantry and cavalry. The people of the castle used drawbridges to get in and out. Even if the invaders could somehow overcome this resistance, there was much work to be done. Whereas the stone castles had stone turrets to keep a lookout and no strong defense on the outside, concentric castles had layers of walls, hence the name. The outer walls, standing between the moat and the turreted defensive wall, were lower. The lower walls were by no means easier to break down. In popular media, sieges are portrayed as an easy solution to stone walls, but in reality, it took weeks and even months to break down the walls. The concentric walls could be up to two meters deep and were filled with rubble on the inside, making it near impossible to break them down. Castles were made to withstand long sieges so that reinforcements could arrive in time. You might ask, well, how about climbing the walls? It was a feasible option unless the other side was keen on boiling pitch. Oh, and don't forget the archers perched on top. After getting through all that, Invaders would come across the courtyard, where, on regular days, the general activities of the castle would have taken place. People seeking protection in uncertain times were most likely to settle outside castles, giving birth to villages as a result. These villagers would head to castles for security. Underneath the courtyard and the tower, there were dungeons. Although not their original purpose, people huddled up in these dungeons in times of need. Staying in the courtyard was usually very dangerous during sieges. This brings us to the next tactic of making the castle surrender, attacking the water supply. Wells were not always on the inside of the castle, and attacks on external wells would have greatly reduced the people's water supply. The antidote to this apparent weakness was the secret entrances and exits that connected with the dungeons. These passages were constructed with different ideas in mind. If the enemy happened upon them, secret passages could also backfire. The simpler stone keeps did not have all these features, but the concentric models that became popular in the 12th and 13th centuries usually did. The Norman castles of medieval times were primarily built in the Romanesque style. It is reasonably easy to identify Romanesque architecture in its main forms in castles and churches. The former was a sanctuary for the body, and the latter served as a sanctuary for the spirit. However, they both commanded authority and were crucial in deciding the socio-political ideas of Europe for years to come. In this era, Gothic architecture came into its own. In terms of Western architecture, it is hard to find anything as lavish and sumptuous as Gothic structures, whether they be early Gothic, high Gothic, 
rayonant gothic, or flamboyant gothic, all of them mesmerizing in different ways. The pre-Romanesque, Romanesque, and Gothic architecture perfectly sum up the evolution of the Middle Ages. Castles range from royal palaces and baronial castles, which were built for barons, to fortified manors. In any case, there were two main reasons for building them. One was to form a social, financial, and administrative hub that, through its magnificence, also served to emphasize the linear hierarchy of the class structures. Making a castle was not an easy task and required a large workforce. There was also considerable landscaping work. All of this meant hiring laborers, some of whom would stick around later to build a quiet life in the surroundings. The second reason was the military aspect of medieval life. It may be hard to see it in the 21st century, but the Middle Ages were a time of constant upheavals. Indeed, the world has not changed much, as we also have Syria, Iraq, and Ukraine as examples. However, political and religious dissent in those times was not impersonal and distant. You could not just put down your phone and be done with it. It was vivid and palpable, and because there was so much of it, it generally was not very far off. Secular humanism had still a few centuries to arrive. Regardless of any ill-conceived notions, one should remember that Europe had never been a land of peace. Amidst the constant toil of violence, barbarism, and uncertainty, undoubtedly a castle may have been all that stood between life and death. We hope you enjoyed this video on what were castles used for in medieval times. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. The link is in the description.